Internet Essentials from Comcast delivers affordable, high-speed internet access. When you're connected, you're ready for anything. Educate Texas is an initiative of the Communities Foundation of Texas. We are dedicated to working side-by-side -side with our partners to empower students to realize their dreams and fuel a thriving Texas. Visit edtex.org to learn more about our work. This is where the future begins. It's time to invest in our future. It's time to help our schools improve for the future. And it's time to give our educators what they need to innovate for the future. Because the future of Texas is in our public schools. All across Texas, there are people and organizations who want to invest in a brighter future for all Texans. We bring philanthropists together to support public education, from the schoolhouse to the statehouse. We are the Texas Education Grantmakers Advocacy Consortium. Learn more at TGAC.org. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Coronavirus in Texas, a virtual event series from the Texas Tribune. As with most of the state, the Tribune has paused our in-person live events, but we're moving the conversation online with this series of virtual interviews. I'm here today with Dr. Latanya Goffney, superintendent of the Aldean Independent School District, and we'll be discussing the impact that the current outbreak is having on public education in the state, as well as how she and her school district are responding to the outbreak until about 8.45 this morning. Dr. Goffney and I will also be answering questions that have already been submitted by our readers throughout the conversation. I want to start by thanking our sponsors for supporting today's conversation, Raise Your Hand Texas, the Texas Education Grantmakers Advocacy Consortium, Lone Star College, Educate Texas, Comcast, and the Texas Association of School Business Officials. We also want to thank KXAN, KPRC2, and Univision 62, who are streaming today's conversation for their media support. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our events, they play no role in determining the content panelists, or line of questioning. If you want to keep tabs on the latest coronavirus news in Texas, subscribe to our evening newsletter for updates at trib.it slash coronavirus. So now I'm going to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Latanya Goffney. In 2018, Dr. Goffney was named superintendent of Aldean ISD, a majority black and Hispanic school district that serves portions of Houston in unincorporated Harris County, and spans across urban centers, suburban hubs, and rural areas. Previously, she served as superintendent of Cold Spring Oakhurst CISD mm -hmm. and Lufkin ISD. And she was named Superintendent of the Year by the Texas Association of School Boards in 2017. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a question that's on a lot of people's minds, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot. Uh, as of this week, Governor Abbott has ordered public schools statewide closed and uh, teaching students remotely through May 4th. And um, Aldean ISD is now closed indefinitely. Does that, what does that actually mean? Do you anticipate reopening before the fall? Um, actually, I was very pleased when Governor Abbott um, closed schools um, until May 4th, unless otherwise extended. Um, in working with our team, uh, we were uh, thinking about what were our options. Um, I've been a superintendent for 12 years, and I had a mentor who said, when you have good information, you can make good decisions. And so um, with the information that we had and uh, we've been following and trying to prepare for the immediate uh, needs of our school and our community, as well as those that were more far out, uh, we determined that it would provide us more flexibility if we said open until further notice. We figured that in the event that all is well, May 4th, then we can make a plan to transition back. But otherwise, we wanted to make sure that our students and our teachers were committed the way that we're trying to educate and meet the needs of all of our students right now. Um, what we thought is it would provide um, some, uh, not only the flexibility, but also a little bit more certainty in the face of some uncertain times. Right. And had, um, had Aldean ISD already had a plan in place for something as massive as a global <laughs> pandemic? <laughs> Listen, I um, graduated from Sam Houston State University and our full program nor the superintendent's program prepared us for um, what to do with the pandemic. I'll tell you, it was in February and uh, we were in a meeting and my chief communication officer received a call from uh, Houston Chronicle and asked if we had a plan in place for um, 
for coronavirus or COVID-19. And she came back into our meeting and she said, hey, what's our plan? And, you know, we immediately went to our crisis intervention plan and we went to our uh, how, uh, our director of health services and she put out some information about washing your hands for 20 seconds and uh, making sure, I think, following somewhat of a protocol that we would do for uh, flu and mm-hmm. other things. So um, a couple of months ago, I would have told you, sure, or a few weeks ago, I would have told you, sure, we, we have plans, but no, honestly, we that we were not planned for uh, these uh, uncertain times, and uh, this is definitely uncharted territory. When did you when did you realize that? Like, do you have a moment <laughs> that you're thinking oh, of? When you realize? Listen, I, I actually uh, have the moment. The moment was March sixth. Um, we've been making plans the whole week leading up to spring break. Uh, we've been making um, um, giving out communication and telling our students to to be safe and following everything. And you know, March sixth sticks out of my mind because we just celebrated all of our teachers, our educators of the year. We had a huge convening uh, at a a local center and we had our board there and everybody was there and we were celebrating. And then afterwards, um, we had gone back to the campuses and um, I received a phone call and call said that we had a, a student who had a 103 fever. And um, he's, he was saying that he may, his parents had been to China or uh, I'm not gonna say the, the specificity of everything to protect his identity, mm-hmm. but it was 240. No, actually, it was 220 and bus in school release at 240. What do you do? Never had a case study on that either. And I, I'll be honest, it, it terrified us. Uh, once we got engaged and our health services responded, and, and then it was a matter of do we have to um, make sure and isolate this student, which we had done, but then what about all the students he'd been with all day? And so, uh, long story short, it wasn't as uh, catastrophic or as severe as we intended. It was an elementary age student who didn't have all of his facts straight and we were a little uh, more um, more concerned than probably we needed to be at the time because the whole story wasn't the whole truth, but we responded accordingly. But what if it had been true? So that was March 6th and that was really the turning point. So we, my team, we spent the whole spring break. Uh, we divided, the, determined a COVID-19 task force and we were looking at what other states were doing, what other schools were doing, and immediately, you know, <laughs> uh, we began to plan for the long term and the short term. And um, there was some assumptions that we were coming back after spring break. And what if we did? But what if we didn't? And so um, I would definitely say March 6th was a turning point for all these. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, part of the uh, so schools are closed, but but part of that is they have to be teaching remotely in order to continue getting their funding. Um, which the state has has made very clear mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, there's been a lot of talk in that about the digital divide, where some families have access to enough devices and to reliable internet, and some just don't at all. Um, and Aldean ISD is majority economically disadvantaged students. Um, what are you taking into account as you build your plans to make sure everyone has devices and, and making sure people actually can uh, learn from home? Um, good question, and I'm glad you asked because another thing that this whole situation has taught me is the fact that leadership matters, and we have uh, leadership at all areas of our district, including at the board level. And our board is um, has always had two major expectations of uh, myself as superintendent and our leadership team: number one, make sure and take care of our students, and number two, make sure and take care of our staff. And they have been very supportive throughout this entire ordeal. Um, We've been uh, daily talks with my board president, Mr. Paul Shanklin. And one of the things that our board has been clear about, we've got to be conscious of the fact that there is a digital divide. As I told you earlier, we have a COVID-19 task force. And so um, our teaching and learning department, literally, they didn't have a spring break and they didn't get a lot of sleep, hadn't gotten a lot of sleep because they built out our at-home learning uh, site. And so our students have access to uh, materials digitally, like we said. As we speak right now, they're preparing to uh, pass out learning packets. We recognize that some students uh, don't. There is a digital divide, and that's been at the the behind, that's been pretty much the one thing that we've been focused on the entire time. What are we going to do for our students who cannot access um, um, our resources online? And so we have the packet. But in addition to that, uh, one of the things that we're doing and utilizing resources 
uh, to make sure that those students who don't have access. So it was really important that we figure out what. Uh, so as we were uh, realized that we weren't coming back, we made sure and we launched not only our All Dean at Home website, but we also launched All Dean Care. And the reason why that was important is because we really needed to know. We've done different surveys to see who has access and who doesn't. And so we, each of our teachers, every single teacher, was responsible for contacting every single student, all 67,000 students in our district. And when they called, it was a well check to see how they were doing, but it was also to ask them a question. Do you have access to a device? And do you have uh, internet connectivity and so on and so forth? And so we received that information back and it's been determined we have about 60% who have access, most to a mobile device. And that's what we want to make sure that all of our at-home uh, materials to be accessed with a mobile device. Uh, for the 40% who don't, that became a major priority. And so we are um, going to be giving Chromebooks out to every one of those students. In addition, we realize that everyone doesn't have the access, like we said, the 40% who don't. And so we're working on uh, ordering hotspots for the handout to those students. Uh, we are looking at putting Wi-Fi on buses. And we recognize that um, we can do all that we can do, but we're hopeful that in this time when everybody's putting forth their best efforts to meet the needs of our students and our communities, that others will also come in and say, hey, why don't we make this available for all during this time, whether it's at t Verizon, or uh, we know Comcast has already stepped up and Xfinity, and so we're hoping more do that. But meanwhile, we're trying to take care of our students through all Dean Cares, and so um, we're in the process of making sure. But the best thing, the one thing that we've done before anything is done our well checks on our students to demonstrate that in all Dean Cares, but also to find out truly how many have access, how many need uh, more resources and, and go from there. Right. And how do you, um, like back to the, the idea of having a plan, um, you know, had you done something like this before? Had you needed to go through and, and survey people to figure out who did and who didn't have access? Like, did you have some sort of sense of the, those percentages ahead of time? Oh, we did, um, just in general, because, you know, we've been talking about blended learning and the role that it plays. Very proud that we do have one-to-one -one access while students are at school, because we have devices on campus, utilizing classrooms, so students have access. But taking those devices home, we never uh, have uh, approached that as a possibility. But surely coming back is going to really inform and change how we do things in the future. So for now, though, but we had many conversations about uh, the needs of our students and providing, uh, I think, some in some ways, uh, the Internet can be an equal, equalizer because everyone has access to the same world of opportunities. But if they can't access that opportunity in their homes because they don't have Wi-Fi or broadband access or whatever, then, of course, it just magnifies the, the digital divide and also um, the equity issues that we face every day. Right. And I think that among the students who daily are challenged by those equity issues are students with special needs, mm -hmm. um, especially those who need you know, certain devices or staff members in order to learn every day. Mm -hmm. um, and districts are still required by federal law to make sure that those kids still have equal access to education. Mm -hmm. um, what is Aldean ISD doing to serve those those students? It was, um, it's interesting you mentioned uh, our staff as well. Uh, as we launched Aldean Cares, it came through our task force that we need to make sure that we checked on and um, took care of our, our teachers. And one of the things that came out of that before we could uh, launch and uh, devices to all of our students, recognizing this, this, this was a new normal for our teachers. And so uh, providing them with the resources and the support to do what we're going to be asking them to do during this unprecedented time. And so um, what we found were there were many of our teachers who didn't have devices at home and many of our teachers who didn't have access. So we've already uh, taken care of our teachers. We had about uh, 612 teachers who came up and got devices. And since then, um, providing the, 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 we couldn't just say starting um, immediately after spring break, knowing that we didn't know when or how long this time was going to last, immediately our teaching and learning department, I'm telling you, we have amazing people, our digital learning specialists. They, I'm not, I'm, I'm probably going to say this, while our, um, our crisis management plan wasn't prepared for this situation, I feel strongly and I feel um, 
proud, not only for our district, but across the state and probably the nation, that our uh, technology people, they were, they were ready. And they've been working fervently to make sure that our teachers are trained on how to use our platform uh, to provide uh, teaching and learning experiences for our students. And our platform is Schoology. And um, we, uh, I got a report where we've been meeting every day, our task force and our chief education officer, our chief academic officer told me that 100% of our schools had been trained and that our teachers, nearly 100% of our teachers had gone through several levels of training. So they're prepared uh, to provide those learning experiences for our students. So very proud of the work that our, our teams are doing. Great. Um, and for but for students with with special needs, mm -hmm. I mean, are there flexibilities for them to be able to, um, you know, change up the curriculum if they need to? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I was uh, going to get to that as well. So we started out with um, with our normal just gen ed preparations, and then we've come in since when we realized this would be more long term. Uh, our uh, special ed, our students with. Uh, learning differences have uh, different challenges or whatever. And so that's really important as a mother of a, a son who has some special challenges. I recognize that that's uh, particularly tough and it's a vulnerable position for a lot of our parents. And we wanted to make sure that we're able to meet their, our students' needs. And so our special ed department has been working overtime and um, working with students, uh, working with staff and uh, other special ed directors across the region to make sure that uh, we have the very best plans and the very best methods from meeting students' needs. In addition, our ELL students have some special needs. We have 504 students. We have recent arrivals. We uh, and all Dean, as well as I'm sure my colleagues as well, are working to meet the needs of every single student. We say all the time, we've said it, you know, all means all. And in all Dean, we work to make sure that, that happens. So all of our teaching and learning people, our uh, schools are prepared to meet the needs of all of our students. So our priority for uh, giving out devices will be for our seniors, of course, our students with special needs, our EL students, and uh, all of the students who are most vulnerable to this situation. And i um, very proud of the work that our all of our teachers and staff are doing to meet the needs during these, these uncertain times. One of our readers, um, Jim Travis, wants to know how you're ensuring that meaningful learning is happening at home. You know, you could give out these devices and end up with students just not doing anything, especially if, I mean, in the case of a district like yours, if they have to babysit their siblings while their parents are working or, you know, essential workers are just need to work in order to get any money in, um, or, you know, they just have, you know, they don't have parents at home to sort of help them out with the homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Is that, is it a priority to make sure that, that that meaningful learning is happening? Well, what I can tell you is, as a, a student of poverty, the last place I would want to be at, at, at was at home. I mean, limited resources, limitations in general, um, um, hardworking grandmother who was, you know, uh, unavailable most times. And so I would not have wanted to be at home during this time. And so while we want meaningful learning, we also recognize that some of our students are in some challenging situations. And so we want to be able to provide resources and support uh, to meet our students' needs uh, socially and emotionally, as well as ensure that meaningful learning is occurring. We recognize that education is the only long-term solution to poverty, but we also recognize that these are uncertain times. And so while we want to ensure meaningful learning, we want to ensure that our students are taken care of. And so uh, our priority, uh, honestly, has been building the, the, the resources to make sure learning can occur but also checking on our students and making sure that they're okay, providing food and different resources for our students. We've engaged our counselors to check on our, our students because it, it's different. Um, unfortunately, with you, uh, even in my own home, it's hard. We recognize that. And so um, I can't even tell you uh, working from home as a superintendent, my husband's a teacher, he's working from home and we have a 16 year old. And um, even with my circumstances, I can't guarantee that meaningful learning is happening with my 16-year-old. But what I can guarantee you is that she's fine, she's okay, she's safe, she's eating, and all is well with her. And what I have for her, I hope and I pray for all of our students, because I recognize that may not be the case. So yes, ideally, I wish I could be <laughs> on here telling you I want meaningful learning, I'll be honest, I told um, our teaching and learning department and as a team, we talked about the fact that uh, we wanted to make sure that um, all the different projects and all the different expectations that we had for our students were 
um, things that they can take and use and hopefully continue their learning. But we didn't want to overextend. We didn't want seven, eight hours of computer uh, uh, work and uh, like you're a magnet online program because what's most important is making sure, number one, that learning does continue because that's important because it we know that. But we also know that many of our students are in some unfortunate situations right now. And this situation is just magnified. It. They've always lived in uh, some circumstances that many of us would shudder. Many of you who never experienced poverty and focused on meaningful learning is one thing, but focused on taking care of our children in a meaningful way is a totally different thing. Right. And so we're trying to focus and balance both. Yeah, and to that effect, the state has has basically canceled the STAR test this year, um, you know, th- that which must be a relief for, for you and, and a lot of your staff. But, you know, and I, kudos to our governor and our commissioner and uh, legislators and everyone who made that happen, because immediately when we realized that things were going to be different, that was the top of mind for everyone. And that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be top of mind for everyone at during times such as this. And so I am so thankful that uh, we don't have to worry about stuff. So, right. But what does that mean for? And and this is also one of our reader questions. What does that mean for graduating seniors, for juniors who are applying to college next year, mm-hmm. for you know the the students in grades where the star means that they can be promoted or mm-hmm. or held back? Um, mm-hmm. What what are you, what are you doing for those students? What are your expectations for how those students will move forward. I'm thankful that we're not alone in Texas, and I'm so grateful for the leadership of our uh, Texas Education Agency and our, our Commissioner of Education, uh, Marath. Mike Marath has led in a way that's provided additional support during these times, and uh, we've been provided flexibility in light of uh, the STAR being uh, canceled for this year, and we are not left to make uh, uh, decisions in isolation. And so, so thankful for the hub of information that's available at the PA website. But our team is working overtime to look at those individual needs and take uh, some of those um, flexible options and uh, put them into action. Uh, Meaning um, our seniors were, I mean, I can't even fathom a senior year like this. I mean, I graduated in 1995. And um, so it's, it's different. But that doesn't mean it's over, that it's doom and gloom. It's just going to be different. Uh, We've been clear we're going to celebrate our seniors, and our seniors are going to graduate. Now, it may not be, and it probably won't be what it's always been, but there will be a celebration of our class of 2020, and we're excited about that. And don't ask me what it's going to look like because I don't know, but I can assure you it's the highlight. Think about it. It's a culmination for our seniors, but it's also the culmination of the work for our district. And so not only our board members, our leadership team, our, our parents, I mean, you love it. Graduation is just like amazing. And so um, that's going to be uh, probably the start of next year or something of that nature. So when we think about our, our juniors and our other students who have uh, great placement um, concerns about SAR, um, actually our commissioner has given, has given us flexibility and we don't have to, we can make those decisions locally. And so um, our team is working on uh, grade placement committees uh, virtually, as well as uh, IDP meetings virtually, and so uh, IDC meetings virtually, and so we are we're excited about moving forward, but just in a different way. It's not the same way. So we're meeting our students' needs. Our every single senior at this moment is being contacted by a counselor from Alden to make sure that they understand what the requirements their requirements are for graduating, and we're part of that work. Our juniors will be looking next year. Won't be the only juniors. It just won't be all the juniors who will be in this boat. It'll be juniors all across the state. So as we've got to let things settle and take time, because again, our decisions are only as good as the information we have. And with the information we have today, without the experience of tomorrow, we are only guessing, speculating, or trying to figure it out. But I know that um, the one thing I know for sure is we have some amazing colleagues across the state and across the nation. I said earlier that leadership matters. And what I can tell you is I'm surrounded by a lot of great leaders, a lot of great thinkers, and uh, we're constantly evaluating where we are and then what we can do to make sure that our students don't lose um, in spite of this pandemic. Right. Um, And so, um, you know, pivoting from academics, you've you've mentioned this a lot already, but kids have and and families have needs that are entirely unrelated to that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and schools are used as a way to get a lot of services Absolutely. that otherwise families wouldn't have access to. One of those is meals. Uh, how are you providing meals right now without putting parents or staff at risk of exposure uh, mm -hmm. to this virus? Um, that's pretty much one of the things that I'm losing sleep about at night because uh, I wonder. Uh, the irony, uh, we have this group meet with uh, female superintendents from across the the state, there are about 150 of us, and there was a question early this morning about the same thing, about how are we going to ensure the safety of our staff while also providing for the needs of our community. Uh, what we've done in Aldine is uh, we started out, and uh, because initially, just had a little information, we were doing Monday through Friday, we were doing a hot breakfast and a hot lunch every single day, and we were very, uh, very proud. Our, our parents were thankful. And I actually went up and um, served a couple of days. I'm telling you, it's hard work. Our child nutrition staff, I'm telling you, they are on the front lines of whatever this is. I know our, our, our president has called this a war. And I'm telling you, we have not only our child nutrition staff, but many others, but them for sure. They're out and they're making sure and making care of the needs of our community. And so for the first two weeks, we did two meals a day, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, this past week, we changed it up after looking at... Um, um, the number of exposures for our staff and our families, and also gas driving to the schools that come and do the grab and go. Uh, and so amazing child nutrition director uh, who is doing phenomenal work and has been working since spring break. Uh, they came up with a plan to decrease the number of days um, from Monday uh, to Monday. And so on Monday, you get three meals. You get a hot meal on Monday, and then you get three meals for Tuesday and Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then on Thursday, you get a hot meal and you get the rest of your meals for the rest of the week. So it's only two days of exposure as opposed to Monday through Friday. And um, in addition, they're following every single protocol uh, to make sure that our, our practice social distancing. And um, instead of handing the meals to parents like they were, they're putting the meals on a table and the parents are responsible for getting out of their cars and, and grabbing them. And so each day, uh, that's why I said the probably the one thing I'm most proud of in our district is we established the, the, the COVID-19 task force and we have subcommittees and each day we meet and uh, evaluate and assess where we are and how we can plan for right now and how we can plan for the future. And so this is one tweak, but still I recognize that all it's going to take is one situation and then we're going to have to continue to reevaluate uh, where, we, where we are and how we meet the needs of our, our, our community. Um, very thankful too. Aldine is a loving, giving community, and there are others who are uh, coming up with different ways to meet the, the, the needs of our families as well. So then the district is not all alone. There are community groups who are helping as well. Right. And how did you get out the information about where the meals were? I remember talking to families at the beginning of the extension of spring break and you know, especially low-income families who maybe didn't have internet, didn't, weren't going on the, the website all the time weren't looking up, you know, mm -hmm. all of the meal sites because they just, they weren't sure mm -hmm. where to go. And, and supermarkets were just cleared out of food, still are, yes, <laughs> uh, right. in a lot of cases. Um, and so people just weren't getting a lot of actually good, nutritious mm -hmm. food if, mm -hmm. if they were getting food at all. How did you get the information out to parents like that? Um, initially, it was hard. Um, the first week, uh, the deputy soup and I were at visiting different sites and it was, uh, steady, people were coming, but not to the level that uh, we thought. And um, we ask, um, I, we are blessed to have a great communications department. So we've done all the social media, we sent out the emails, we sent out the alerts, but people still weren't responding as much. And um, my response too is having a, uh, a lot of people attend. I mean, you can't really judge by the number who take advantage of whether or not it's good or bad. It just is. This is a service that we're providing for our community. And so for those who need it, we want them to come. And if they don't, then of course we want those who need it to be able to get it. So it was hard to judge, but we didn't want the fact that they weren't coming to be because they didn't know. And so we wanted to make sure they had the information. So as they would come up, drive up, we were asking, um, how did you find out about us? And they were sharing, and most were saying social media. But then there were others who were doing some things strategically. And it, was, it came from our child nutrition department. Uh, one of the teachers said, you know what, uh, the worker, she said, I'm going to post it in our next door. Um, you know, they have all these forums that I don't know much about, but you probably do as a reporter. But they, uh, like these next door apps and different things in the community. In addition, all, each one of them had, uh, we had a police officer who was working. 
And so we had police officers who were more resource officers for our community. They went and drove around and would tell uh, students and, or people that they saw to come out. We put signs up in the community and we continued to just send out more alerts, uh, put out more information, ask everyone to share, and uh, eventually the word got out. And we're very proud of, I, I say proud, but we're about to provide a resource for our families. On an average day, we serve about 100,000 100, meals to students. Um, and on average, last week, we served 49,000. And so we are uh, meeting, definitely, definitely meeting a need in our community. Right, yeah. Um, and what happens to, um, you've, you've talked about this a little bit with the people sort of staff members being repurposed. Mm-hmm. for other things now that school is closed. You you might not have a need to drive kids to school every day, but maybe you can use those same staff members in another capacity. Uh, what are you doing in order to make sure that people are still having work and, and what's happening to their pay, especially for the mm-hmm. hourly workers who don't mm-hmm. necessarily have the security like full-time teachers do? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I told you earlier, I'm blessed to work for a great board, as many of my colleagues can attest to as well. Uh, we passed a resolution that we would continue to pay in these uncertain times. And so all of our staff, every single member of our staff is continuing, is continuing to get paid. Um, those um, that are make sure that we are uh, in compliance and that we're safe and limiting exposure we do have skeleton crews who are going out and doing critical work to keep our, our district moving forward because the paychecks just, just don't show up. They've got to be processed. And so uh, we have many of our staff members, uh, well, actually, all, most of our staff members reporting and working from home. And then we have skeleton crews who are reporting to do work that cannot be done or completed from home. Okay. And, and the pay, um, I know some districts are doing Premium pay or ten yes. and a half if you have to go in to work. Mm-hmm. Yes, and our last resolution included the premium pay uh, for those who have to go into work. And then, um, you know, um, I can tell you from a grateful heart and speaking, um, there's no there's no question that those who are um, working each day deserve the premium pay. Great. And one of our readers um, wants to know how you think that the response during this event will evolve instructional models over the long term for schools and students. Like, what do you see taking from this down the line, you know, after hopefully soon uh, this pandemic comes to an end? Well, um, I've told our team, I I don't see... um, I see it, you know, stretching and then going back to the business as usual once um, this is passed. I think this, uh, for the first time, and everything that you're reading and every conversation I've had with colleagues, this is totally going to transform what we do. This is going to help us, I think, um, you know, there's, this is bitter and sweet that it's, think about this, overnight, (laughs) pretty much, um, we have changed how we educate kids. If we'd had to come up with a committee, had a design team, it could have taken us years to completely go in the position uh, that we're going in now, the direction that we're going in now. And so when we come back, we wanna make sure that um, this is the norm. You know, we have built out a site, parents have been asking for years, how can we help our kids at home? For those uh, parents who have the time, the resources and the abilities to be able to commit. And, you know, we do the, the, you know, the muffins with moms, the donuts with dads, and we would do little things. But now we're going to have a site that's built out with resources. My daughter, when uh, I talked about her earlier, um, she told me one day, she uh, actually this week, that uh, her assignment on Schoology, she said, Schoology's not working. I said, oh, yes, it is. Schoology's working. <laughs> she said, no, it's not working. And I, you know, she could be a turkey. So I was like, okay. So I texted my CAO and I said, uh, chief of schools, I said, school is you working? She goes, no, uh, they have an uptick in the number of people who are accessing it nationwide. So it wasn't working. And so um, I thought, you know, as a parent, I don't even know how to access school is uh, or as a, a school employee. So we have this site built out for how to help parents to utilize the different resources that we're putting in place. In addition to that, 
it shouldn't be a push. I'm speaking Latanya here. It shouldn't be, uh, regardless of what district you're in, it shouldn't be um, in the past when you had conversations in any district, every district that I've worked in about one-to-one -one and providing devices, it was, will they take care of them? Will they sign this piece of paper? Will they do this? Will they do that? Will they do this? Well, this situation has pushed that we don't have time to worry about what won't go right because we're worried about if we don't do something. And so this created a, a sense of urgency to uh, provide students with additional resources where learning can take place. Do I look forward to this pandemic and returning to work? Absolutely. But do I also look forward to reimagining how we educate students? In addition, uh, perhaps you, you talked a, a lot about our, the demographics of our district. And we are proud of the work um, that we've done. We're proud of what was happening in our classrooms, of course. I hate that uh, we won't be able to celebrate some of that at the, the end of the year, but I'm concerned because as I stated earlier, um, we want meaningful learning to take place, but we also re recognize the majority of our students, some of the challenges they're, they're living with. And while we believe that education is so important at this period, and so in the event that um, we come back, there's going to be some significant gaps, but what are we going to do about it? And so um, we already have a, uh, um, a plan as we're thinking beyond this uh, pandemic, how are we gonna make up for the loss of meaningful instruction? How are we gonna make up for uh, the fact that if you go and do any search, uh, and I'm not even one of them, there are some great lessons and great things happening. I mean, parents who set up little homeroom classrooms, they, I mean, just amazing things happening. And then you have those who are like me are worried about the next meal, like I would have been in at the same situation. And so how are we gonna make up for not only the loss of instruction, but also the, the gaps that have become even more significant because of zip code. And so, yes, I think it's gonna change in, in many ways for the good, because we're not gonna hesitate to put devices in students' hands and let them walk home, take them home. But I think uh, we're gonna have to continue to reimagine education as it is or as it was pre-COVID-19. Uh, Can you talk more about that, starting to think about that plan for, mm -hmm. for next year? I mean, the this is likely to be a setback for a good number of students, both academically, but also socially, um, and with their mental health as well, um, especially for, for kids in, in your district or, or in certain demographics. How do you prep for the fall when, I mean, you don't know necessarily when you're coming back. Mm -hmm. um, two, in two spaces, we've talked about, uh, and uh, perhaps the one that we most spent the most time on is the academics. Uh, and thinking about, um, you know, last year, we're really proud to roll out our, our summer camp experiences and they were amazing and our parents were pleased. And so we were planning for those this summer. And so I was talking to um, our, our lead on that for this upcoming summer. And so they've already pivoted and started thinking about, no, this is going to be a bridge and how we're going to do that. And so the timeline depends on the, whatever situation we find ourselves in, you know, with better information. And so uh, our summer learning experiences are going to look different. In addition, I was talking to another colleague uh, from the Dallas area, and we were thinking about... Um, um, I just hate to put it out there, but I'm going to say it, but we're going to have to look at a different school calendar. We're going to have to look at what school looks like. It cannot be August to, uh, to May, because again, um, I, I recognize that even under the best of circumstances for our district, this is going to, going to put us back instructionally. It's going to put us back emotionally. Keep in mind our, 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 our district's uh, and schools have been the first line of, of defense when um, any type of abuse occurs or any type of uh, things that aren't appropriate or whatever for our students. And so our, our, we have behavior improvement plans that aren't uh, being maintained at this time. We have all kinds of different situations that is going to set us back. And so as we think about how we're going to make up for all, the, all these deficits and this lost time and all of that, then it can't be with the same lens that uh, we had before. 
And so does that mean maybe lengthening the, the school calendar for the upcoming Absolutely. year? Mm-hmm. Ex- absolutely. We had um, some talks about what that could possibly look like. And we actually have a, uh, a in Aldi, we have a team who's looking at what can that look like? If not for an entire district, what can it look like for certain schools or certain programs? And uh, I know uh, Region 4, uh, SOUPs are already thinking about how can we uh, collectively address what this problem is going to be and thinking about some some ways and some strategies. And so, but it can't be more of the same. It, it can't be. And so that's exciting, but yet it's, it's concerning as right. we deal with the challenge today, you know? What resources do you think that you'll need from the state in order to move forward in the next academic year? You know, there's another legislative session coming up in 2021. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> and I'm sure that that a lot of that will be about uh, this global pandemic. What do you expect that um, you as a superintendent will ask of the state? Well, I hope that, because uh, again, we started on a high after the last legislative session with House Bill 3. We're excited about some of the, um, the, the things that we were going to be able to do for students and have been able to do for students and seeing uh, the manifestation of that work. Um, and so hopefully that will be extended in light of unfinished year. In addition, um, as I said earlier, our commissioner is giving us great flexibility, and I hope that flexibility continues even as we, we return. Because keep in mind, um, um, uh, STAR was, uh, our students are worried about uh, what's going to happen for our seniors, and of course, that's top of mind for us. And then you ask a really good question. You ask about, well, what about our juniors, and what about our sophomores, and all of that? So there are implications, even for those students who are not a part of the class of 2020. So we recognize that STAR uh, was canceled this year, but there are implications for STAR next year. And so it's going to take time. It's going to take creating minds. And in and, and, and the words of our commissioner, reimagining what we do for education and how we account for, uh, for progress. So I'm hoping that the resources continue. Um, again, House Bill 3 was a blessing for our district as well as uh, countless other districts in, in the state, and we were able to do good work, and we're looking forward to continuing that work once we're able to. Uh, and so we hope uh, also there's an appreciation for the job that our teachers have done. I'm telling you, without uh, any call to action, without any level of preparation, they immediately accepted the call uh, to address this pandemic and to be on the front as far as providing resources and support for our students. And so I hope uh that our uh, public education is magnified to a level of appreciation as opposed to uh, sometimes we take a beating. Uh, but I think there's no time like now to demonstrate just how much we're responsible for. We're not just responsible for that meaningful instruction. We're responsible for the whole child. And so um, just um, making sure that the state understands that. I know they do. I absolutely I feel more confident now that they do going through this situation. And I'm hopeful that it doesn't end because the pandemic ends, because the the the, the challenge of, of coming out of the pandemic are still going to be significant as well. Right. We just have a few more minutes here. Okay. I wanted to ask. It goes yeah. fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes fast. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, as you move toward potentially not coming back uh, this school year, what is, um, you know, one of the things short term that you're looking at being maybe one of the, the largest challenges that you have or one of the, <clears throat> the largest um, issues that you you know that you'll have to, to tackle? Top of mind for me um, are seniors. I can't say it enough. Um, we are um, we reached out to them and they've been sharing different information via social media and they've been uh, asking questions and wondering um, um, what's, what's next. I mean, you, you read some of their, their concerns and their information it takes you know, um, I think back, as I say, said, we had senior skip day. They're having a whole semester and to not um, be able to really know what's next or have the calendar of events for May, um, we understand that. And so um, top of mind is making sure that we're able to celebrate our seniors. And then um, um, at some point, and then, of course, taking care of our students, our most vulnerable students, uh, is a major concern. And so um, uh, regardless of uh, what happens, we've got to figure out a way to uh, be a resource and uh, a support for, for all of our students. Great. Great. 
Well, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. I'm, I'm sure everyone appreciated hearing from you. Um, and thank you, everyone who's, uh, who's watching and who's, who's tuned in. Thank you.